Good afternoon, um, and welcome to the extension of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. I am Elizabeth Sackler, and uh, this is the second day of a weekend of celebrations um, really for the second anniversary. It's exactly two years since uh, we opened the Center for Feminist Art, and it has been a wonderful two years. We opened the center uh, not only to be our permanent home for the dinner party by Judy Chicago, which it is, but also to have educational programming such as this, to have arts programming, to have other exhibitions, history exhibitions, history exhibitions, and, uh, and the like, and we have had tremendous success over the last two years and are very much looking forward to our continued growth. Um, there is a quote which I would like to read to you which comes from the um, 1888 notebooks of uh, Nietzsche. It was one of the last, uh, it's a little snippet. It was one of the last uh, pieces that he wrote and he says, we possess art lest we perish of the truth. And I love that, um, and I think it's sort of relevant for today's panel and for those of you who are here who are artists who are involved in the art world, in the art market, in museums and so on. Art plays such a deeply important part, uh, role in our culture, in our lives, in the lives of our children, our family, our health. And I think that uh, everything that all of us, each of us can do to support art, to support artists uh, is certainly uh, in line. It's as important as taking the best of care of our little ones and our, our next generation. So I welcome you. And I'm delighted uh, today to, uh, in, uh, to, to have the market women artists from collection to cultural record here. Last year, um, Kat Griffin came with a panelist of uh, artists uh, also co-sponsored by AIR, and we, we had it in the forum, which is our presentation space uh, in the center, and it was overflowing, and many people didn't get in. A lot of people were really disgruntled. So it's delightful this year that this auditorium has become available and that we're able, because we, I can see looking out that we would not have been able to uh, have seated you all. So this is, this is absolutely terrific. Um, the panel today is going to be looking at why women's art is undervalued and the art market and how the current art market uh, has evolved to be what it is and are there strategies for parity and these are questions that are very important to me. Parity we look for uh, for men and women in all walks of life, be it professional, be it uh, salaried, be it uh, employment opportunities. And as we know, uh, women artists, feminist artists do not fetch uh, what male artists do, uh, either living nor dead. So uh, it doesn't much matter to look forward and say, oh well, once I die, my art's really gonna be worth something. Because if you're a woman, that's no guarantee. And my hope is, of course, not only will the panelists set, shed some light on this, but maybe even come up with strategies that we can all work towards. I'd be really happy for that. I think a lot of people would. Deborah Harris is joining us, Claire Oliver, Sue Scott, Deepan Jana uh, Klein, and uh, Ferris Olin is co-moderating uh, with Kat Griffin. And I'd like first to introduce Kat. Kat has been the director of AIR Gallery since 1996, and AIR was founded, as most of you know, and many of you are involved with, I think, in 1990, uh, 1972, as the first artist-run not-for-profit gallery for women. I think it was really kind of a cooperative uh, in, in, its, in its day. Uh, Kat's recent writings have centered on trans men's visual culture, including a published essay entitled The Boy and the Blue Dress uh, in Imago, the, the drama of uh, self-portraiture -port in recent photography, which was published uh, by Rutgers University. And Rutgers is here, I think, in, in full form, and Rutgers has such a, been a, such a great sister, I feel, with the center, and that um, hopefully all of our works are paying off and spreading. We have to spawn a lot more centers and Rutgers and all kinds of things. Uh, so Kat, in September of 2007, curated Material Matter, uh, American Abstract Artists at Sideshow Gallery in Brooklyn here, 
and most recently co-curated with Dina and Carrie Lovelace, both women I'm sure you all know well, a three-part exhibition uh, event series, AIR Gallery, the History, Works, and Archival Material from 1972 to the Present. And it opened at AIR, and it's now at the Tracy Barry Gallery at NYU. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, by all means try to do so. It's very important. It's on view until April 15th. Um, and hopefully spring will be with us by then. I hope you enjoy this panel immensely, and I will be back up here to uh, sort of wrap up and say adieu. But meanwhile, Kat Griffin, it's wonderful to welcome you, your panelists, and thank you for celebrating the second anniversary of the center with us here. Again, uh, welcome, and thank you all for joining us for the market, women artists from collection to cultural record. This is uh, the second in a two-part panel series on women's art in the marketplace, um, and it's part of a series, um, like Elizabeth said, that's organized by AIR Gallery, the Feminist Art Project, and the Institute for Women in Art at Rutgers University. For the second year, we are holding this panel series at the Brooklyn Museum and the Tribeca Performing Arts Center. Uh, the panel series are designed to tackle topics that are critical to the lives and work of women artists as part of our month-long uh, celebration of women in the arts in March. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sackler for your wonderful, warm welcome, and also thank Eleanor Whitney for helping us um, organize this, and the AI artists who helped as well, um, and the Brooklyn Museum overall, the staff here. Um, this month events will accumulate with Night Air this Thursday, March 26th. Um, at AIR Gallery, which is also um, now a closer neighbor located at 111 Front Street um, in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn. And the program for Night Air is going to include food and refreshments from local eateries and a wonderful short program of video pieces by um, emerging uh, women artists that was curated by Lily Way in conjunction with our eighth biennial exhibition, um, which is currently up at the gallery um, through March 29th. Um, now I'd like to start by introducing our distinguished uh, panelists, and this will be in the order of which, that, which they will speak. The longer bios for all of them can also be found in the press releases that I think many people um, received as they were uh, coming in. Um, in 1993, Claire Oliver founded her gallery in Florida before moving to Philadelphia in 1997 and relocating to New York in 2001. She represents both emerging and mid-career artists. Um, they have a commitment to physical process and intensity of detail, which is common to all of her gallery artists. The gallery is committed to working with established international artists and collaboratives, producing large-scale thematic projects, such as the Green Project, um, which was at Art My um, Miami, uh, Miami Art Week in 2008, and they're also committed to showing multimedia work. Claire Oliver Gallery artists are represented in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Tate Modern, the Smithsonian and many other museums. Some of the gallery artists include Julie Blackman, Jennifer Poon, Stephanie Lempert, Judith Schechter, Janet Biggs, and Phyllis Bramson. In, two th um, in November 2008, Sue Scott opened Sue so Scott Gallery on the Lower East Side after having been an independent curator, collector, artist, um, sorry, art advisor, and writer for more than 20 years. Concurrently, she served as an adjunct curator for the Orlando Museum of Art for 19 years, where she organized numerous one-person exhibitions for artists, including Jane Hammond, Leslie Dill, Alex Katz, and Jennifer Bartlett, as well as numerous group shows. She has also organized exhibitions for the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Dorsky, and the Virginia Beach Museum. In 2007, she co-wrote After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art with Eleanor Hartney, Nancy Prinsenthal, and Helene Posner. Deborah Harris was named the managing director of the Armory Show Modern in August 2008. Harris has over 20 years of experience in magazine publishing. She began her career at Art and Auction in its early years and went on to become advertising manager of Art News and advertising director of Art in America. Most recently, she oversaw all the art-related sales for LTB Media, including Art and Auction, Modern Painters, artinfo.com, and Gallery Guide. 
Deepanjana Klein is a specialist in the modern and contemporary Indian art department at Christie's. She has been a curator in New York City since 2000 and has many exhibitions to her credit. She has a PhD in Indian art history from De Montfort University in England and has taught art history, theory, and aesthetics at Leicester School of Architecture in England and the KRVI Mumbai. She is currently working on a set of books on sculpture and cave architecture um, of Elora. Her publications include contributions to the Encyclopedia of Sculpture and several published essays on contemporary Indian art. She is the recipient of awards including a grant from the Mellon Foundation, the J.N. Tate Endowment for Higher Education of Indians, and the Nehru uh, Trust for Indian Collections at the Victoria and Alberts Museum. Um, now I also have the pleasure of introducing our co-moderator, Ferris Olin. Um, she will be speaking a little bit about the topic today before the panelists give their presentations. Uh, Ferris Olin is the co-director of the Institute for Women in Art, co-curator of the Mary H. Dana Women Artist Series, founder and co-director of the Feminist Art Project, um, and project co-director for WAND, Women Artists Archive National Directory, all at Rutgers University. Dr. Olin is a noted art historian, curator, women's studies scholar, um, as well as librarian. She received the 2007 Annual Recognition Award from the College Art Association's Committee on Women in Art. In 2008, she was awarded the Art to Life Award from AIR Gallery and Art and Living Magazine, the, Paul, uh, the Alice Paul Equity Award, and the Douglas Medal from Douglas College. She has served in the board of the College Art Association, College Art Association the Women's Project of New Jersey, and the Neighborhood Narratives Project. Fair, so Lynn. Thank you, Kat. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Institute for, for Women and Art at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, also known as the IWA, I too want to thank you uh, and welcome you to this afternoon's program and thank the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art and the Brooklyn Museum for hosting this event and I'm delighted to be here on its second anniversary. I direct the Institute along with my colleague Judith K. Brodsky. It is the only research center in the United States focusing its activities on women and art. Our vision is to transform values, policies, and institutions and to ensure that the intellectual and aesthetic contributions of diverse communities of women in the visual arts are included in the cultural mainstream and acknowledged in the historical record. The Institute's mission is to invent, implement, and lead live and virtual education, research, documentation, public programs, and exhibits focused on women artists and feminist art. The IWA strives to establish equality and visibility for all women artists who are underrepresented and unrecognized in art history, the art market, and the contemporary art world, and to address their professional development needs. We endeavor to serve all women in the visual arts and diverse global, national, regional, and state audiences. This afternoon's program in collaborations with AIR Gallery and the Sackler Center exemplifies the partnerships and the programming that we initiate. Currently, the Institute is engaged in three programmatic areas. Our exhibitions and sponsored lectures primarily center on the Mary H. Dana Women Artist Series, which was founded in 1971 by Joan Snyder and is the oldest continuous running exhibition space dedicated to making visible the work of emerging and established contemporary women artists. Through the Getty-funded Women Artists Archive National Directory, WAND, an innovative web directory, scholars are able to locate primary documents about women artists active in the U.S. since 1945. There are now more than 13,000 women artists listed in WAND from among 1,200 archival collections found in the directory. The National Collaborative Feminist Art Project, of which AIR is a program, founding program partner, is administered by the Institute and celebrates feminist art and women's aesthetic and intellectual impact on our culture. We now have 32 regional coordinators working with institutions and individuals in their geographical areas across the United States 
to promote our goals through programs, exhibitions, and special projects. At this point, there are more than 1,000 events, such as this one, that are listed on our website calendar through 2013. We also have been developing a kindergarten to 12th grade feminist art education section on the site that will provide virtual access to model curricular materials teaching about women artists. I'd like to take this opportunity to plug an event we will hold on May 17th, to which you are all invited. We will honor the distinguished artist Faith Ringgold, who will receive an honorary degree from Rutgers, her 21st. And we will open the major exhibition of her 50-year career, both with a gala celebration. So please do come. This afternoon's program is the second in our March series to examine women in the art market. Presentations by the panelists of, during the first program led to a lively conversation, which I have no doubt will be continued this afternoon. Once all of today's panelists have spoken, we plan to engage in discussion amongst the presenters, and then we will take questions from you in the audience. Let me make some introductory comments about women artists, collections, and the cultural record. Between 1989 and 1992, I interviewed a selected number of American women art collectors to ascertain how the social upheavals of the 1950s and 60s had impacted their collecting practice. I chose four women, then between the ages of 70 and 90, who determined the scope of their collections in that time period and in some cases in reaction to the civil rights, anti-war, and feminist movements. Although they resided in Washington, Des Moines, near the Nebraska border, and Los Angeles, and represented various points of view along the political spectrum, they shared some commonalities. Three collected art exclusively by women. One collection focused on art of the avant-garde, one on the artists of 19th and 20th century from Europe and America with an emphasis on the American West, and one chose to amass a collection representing a survey of Western art from the Renaissance through modern times. The fourth woman collected art from underrepresented populations, Native American, Chinese, and the African diaspora. I can't say for sure if they had seen the 1986 Guerrilla Girls poster commenting on the activities of art collectors, but clearly this specific group of collectors on whom I focus my attention consciously chose to forge a path not taken by their male counterparts. Among the women artists who could be found in these collectors' homes were Kati Kalwitz, Betty Saar, Frida Kahlo, Louise Bourgeois, Barbara Kruger, Judy Chicago, Natalia Goncharova, Clementine Hunter, Leonora Carrington, Paula Moderson Becker, Sonia Delaunay, Isabel Bishop, Elizabeth Catlett, Agnes Martin, Suzanne Valadon, Bert Morisot, E.J. Montgomery, Helen Lundeberg, Lavinia Fontana, Clara Peters, Hannah Hook, Rosa Bonheur, Margot Humphrey, and the list could go on. Much of the works were acquired during the same time period when the majority of other collectors sought out works by artists who had already entered the art historical canon. Artworks by women artists and artists of color sold at prices much lower than their white male counterparts and were more readily available. In two cases, the women began collecting in part to decorate new homes, but then began, became so engrossed in the historical erasure of women artists that they actively found ways to contribute to the knowledge base of the new art history through publications and institutional support. The two others had political agendas focused on transforming society, and this was illustrated by their curatorial and scholarly research and involvement with social activist groups, and their leadership in establishing lasting institutional presence for artists of color and women. More than two decades later, we are still seeing a pattern of devaluing work by women artists who remain invisible to the majority of collectors, such as Eli Broad. In 2008, the Broad Collection at the LA County Museum of Art was comprised of 30 artists. 97% were 
white, 87 are male. 194 artists are held in the Broad Foundation collection, of whom 96 are white and 83% are male. In the 1985 poster, the Gorilla Girls noted that only 10% of artists represented by New York City galleries were women. While over 20 years later, the art collective Brainstormers, using data published by Jerry Saltz, reported that 34% of Chelsea galleries represented women artists. The 2008 Sotheby's Contemporary Art Sale included only 17% of works by women. Among the highest selling artists, only one was a woman, Louise Bourgeois. The art market is often on our minds. Some in the art world, like Chuck Close, speculate that reputations and market values are influenced by what other artists think. At a Rutgers conference just this past Friday, organized by the Institute for Women in Art, more than 125 artists, artists registered to learn about planning for their artistic legacy. I mentioned then that sociologists Kurt and Gladys Engel Lang identified four factors that assure the future recognition of an artist, even if they do not receive recognition in their lifetime. The cultural record can be influenced by the artist's own efforts during her lifetime to protect, to project and, uh, pr um, and protect her reputation and the availability of others who can preserve and boost the artist's reputation after her death. Her links to artistic, literary, or political networks and her symbolic associations with emerging cultural and political identities will further facilitate entry into cultural archives and thus the cultural record. In a review of notable events of 2008, a year characterized by Holland Cotter as a year that may go down into history books as the first catastrophic fall, but also as the first vital correction for art in the new century, he noted that feminism lives and that the art emerging from the early feminist movement of the 1970s is the source. Thank you. Can you go back one, please? Bravery is not a lack of fear. It is proceeding in spite of that. When I was a teenager growing up in Southern California, I was offered a full scholarship to come here to New York City to study at Parsons School of Design. I was absolutely thrilled at the prospect of starting my life here in the big city and making a difference and doing something fabulous. But my mother was terrified about me moving away from home and moving to the big city and she told me I'd be mugged and I'd have no friends and I'd be all alone. And all of my friends in Southern California told me, it's so mean in New York and everyone will chew you up and spit you out. Well, I allowed those friends and my mother to dictate my fate and I never did come and study at Parsons. Instead, I allowed their fear of failure to be projected onto me. As a young and impressionable girl, I didn't have the experience that I have now. So I can tell you, feel the fear and do it anyway. I live my life by this. What's the worst that can happen? You will survive it. I've survived it. Nothing that is worth accomplishing is easy, easily won. I began my gallery with just over a thousand square feet and just about as much money in the bank. I did have something that was far more important than money or connections though, and that is a real passion for what I do every day and a love for learning about new art. After 15 years of hard work and dedication, I'm proud to have built a 5,000 square foot ground floor space on one of the most prestigious blocks in the country for contemporary art. 
Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about embracing what comes naturally to us as women, what I do personally to help my community and my gallery, and how to challenge yourself to create your own bright and successful future. Women are by nature nurturers. We are family and community oriented. By translating our ability to be good listeners and to be compassionate human beings into business terms, we are by definition great networkers. Use those skills to push your career ahead. When you find yourself in a crowded room of strangers at a gallery opening, what do you do with that exciting opportunity? Good networking is not about papering the room with your, with your cards. It's about finding that one person you have a personal connection with and continuing the conversation on after that event is over. Woody Allen once said, 90% of success is just showing up. I'm sure he was joking when he said that, but I believe it's true. Keep on trucking. Keep putting one foot in front of the other and you will build your friends and colleagues and you will be able to exchange knowledge and create new ideas together. Times change and we must change with them or we will be left in the historical dust. Try to embrace the new tools that technology makes available to you and use those to further your craft. This is the Russian collaborative AES plus F. I've represented their work for over 10 years now, and they embody the ideal. Tatiana is A, she is the leader of the group. She's an inspiration. She's always learning the latest techniques in computer animation. She's always finding out who the hottest new artist is and how they relate to art history. When this cover came out, I had many people who commented to me about the age of the gang. Their work is so sophisticated, yet it's so young and fresh. We thought they were in their 20s. AES is always anticipating what will come next, and this is what keeps them on the forefront and an active uh, body for discussion. Do you have a Facebook page? If you do, you should friend me. If you don't, go home and make one for yourself. This is a wonderful and easy way to spread the word on what you're doing, and of course, you'll get the word on what everybody else is doing too. It keeps you connected with your community, and you can make it as close or as distant a relationship as you would like. My gallery has three artists that are represented in this year's Venice Biennale. That's something we're very proud about, and we want everybody who is interested in these works to know about it. I put this up on our website, I sent a mass email to about 5,000 critics, curators, and collectors, and I sent a mass mail message to all my Facebook friends. I am a female gallerist, that's a fact. Since I've never been a male gallerist, I really have nothing to judge against in terms of how hard it is to make new clients or to get work placed in public collections. I am so successful at what I do because I define myself as a gallerist not as a female gallerist. Which of these works were created by a female artist? Do you know, is it hard for you to tell? They're all female artists. When I'm looking at a new work of art or a portfolio of an artist's work, I do not judge that work by its gender, but rather by what I'll call the three C's. That is content, craft, and continuity. A great work of art must embody all three. This doesn't mean that you need to like all these works, but you can respect it for its validity. Content, what is the artist trying to tell us? Good art is both personal and universal. The artist puts something of themselves into their work and yet the viewer is not overwhelmed by that. The viewer is able to see, taste, touch, hear, smell the work in such a way that they can internalize it and bring their own experiences to that work of art. This creates the interaction with that work of art. One of my best compliments I ever received was very early in my career from an elderly and charming collector who was the founder of the Village Voice. After spending a great deal of time studying the work in the gallery, she plopped down in a chair across the desk from me and proclaimed, congratulations, my dear, I hate it. I can't remember my response, I'm sure I mumbled something, but Miss Hutchinson replied, as everything you do, Claire, I either love it or hate it, but
but I can't ignore it. The second thing is craft. This should be a given with a visual uh, artists, yet sloppy workmanship and inattention to detail are not uncommon. The difference between a great idea and a great work of art is often how it is crafted. A fine attention de to detail can be seen in the works here of Kate Clark. Each small dressmaker's pin is painstakingly pushed into the clay. Kate leaves visible the seams in her work, however, reminding the viewer that the exotic and wild has just been undone hinting at an underlying violence that she is just beneath her beautiful portraiture. My third criteria in judging an excellent work of art is con continuity. This not only means the artists themselves have personal traits of professionalism and ethics, but also they have a long-term career agenda in which there is a logical progression of ideas and exploration for each new body of work. I want to see an artist embrace the possibilities and continue to explore without fear of failure. Janet Biggs wanted to get ground up shots of the fastest woman in the world for her latest video. So she built this chair that hung her off the back of the pace car, just inches above the ground. She's crazy, but it was very effective. <laughs> an excellent example of these three C's is Judith Schechter's work. When Judith sets out to make a new piece of art, it begins just as a doodle when she's sitting in front of the television set. These doodles are little split-second commentaries on what's going on in pop culture or mass media, but for Schechter, it's not important to create a full narrative for each work. The viewer will bring to that work his or her own emotional baggage, and will see in that work what they want to see. It can be as shallow as the beautiful color and patterning, or as deep as Schechter's commentary on the war in Iraq. Working to get my artists into the public record is in large, in large part what I do as a gallerist. I'm in contact with public institutions for which my artists will be of interest. I send press releases to media. I coordinate traveling exhibitions of my artist's work. The gallery hosts approximately eight solo shows a year in our Chelsea exhibition space and they're planned about a year and a half in advance. The work you're looking at here is Judith Schechter's spectacular 12-foot Seeing is Believing, a permanent installation at the Museum of Arts and Design at 2 Columbus Circle. This work was two years in the planning and development between myself, the curator, the director, their chief fundraiser, and the architect of their new building. Only by investing and taking a long-term approach and by relationship building, were we able to make such a significant contribution to both the artist's career and the collection of the Museum of Art and Design. For me, a blanket approach is, uh, approach is ineffective. It's all about specific relationships. By listening to those who have an interest and showing them only those artists or works that I feel fulfill their specific needs, I become a valuable asset to them and they become one for me. My challenge to you all for the future is to set high goals for yourself. Be positive that you can make a difference in your community. Every one of you here today has already expressed a per personal commitment by spending your Sunday afternoon with us discuss discussing a topic that you feel strongly about. There is no magic bullet answer for writing women into the historical record. History itself will tell future generations how we did it. We are too close now to know the correct answer, but let's start moving forward today. Looking back, and uh, looking back and comparing your career path with others will not make your path smoother or straighter. Focus on your own victories and use them as small stepping stones for larger victories for yourself and those you care about. Be upbeat, be positive. People are attracted to those, and so you will become your own self-fulfilling prophecy. Love and believe in what you do, and you will be successful at it. Thank you. In the book I um, wrote with Eleanor, Nancy, and Helene, um, one of the things we wanted to look at was women in the um, 
gallery scene and museum scene. And what interested me about that was um, the idea of women in the marketplace uh, translated also as, as the notion of women and power. And so what we first looked at is um, the, the book looked at, at, at women in the art world uh, post um, mid 1970s, the, the feminist revolution. So um, we looked over uh, 30 years of, um, of galleries, solo galleries as uh, between men and women. And you can see here in the chart the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, and, and then um, the total. And what we came up with, I'm going to move over these uh, uh, quickly and we could talk about them later if you'd like to, is that um, though it did come up from the 70s into the 90s and 2000, um, you can see, women roughly showed about um, just short of 20% of the time uh, solo shows to men's solo shows. The percentage is about the same, a little bit better in museums, and museums have gotten better um, in this century uh, with about 24% women showing to um, male solo shows. Uh, a question that we didn't put into the book, but we want to put into our second book, is um, how does this compare, and this came out of questions from panel discussions that we did, how does this compare with people coming out of MFA programs across the country? Well, we're still gathering that data, but um, Yale happens to have um, all of the information um, uh, together, and they were able to give it to us. And if you look at Yale, maybe as symbolic of, of other um, major MFA programs across the country, you can see that in the 70s there were about uh, 12 women uh, to, let's say, about 26 men. The men are in the blue, the women are in the pink. The um, women attending um, major schools and, and graduating with MFAs has gone up considerably. The male, the blue, you can see, is somewhere between 25 and 30, almost all the way across. There was a spike in the 90s of women, um, which is interesting if you think about the 90s, especially the early 90s, as a, as a downward spike in the art market, uh, which is a time when women actually do better um, in, the art, in the art market. And then it ends with the, the men in 2006 um, at about 25 and then the women at 32. So what we, can, what we can garner by this is the fact that more women are coming out of the MFA programs and yet they're going into the gallery and museum system with about 20% of the um, representation. I just sort of throw this in because, you know, for points of discussion. How does this compare with the rest of the world? Well, look at... Um, this was in the New York Times Magazine last year. Um, look at the number of women. I don't think this takes into account the fall election, but look at the number of women who are in the Senate, 16%, House of Representatives, 16%, Governors, 16%, State Legislatures is higher, 24%. So really, it's uh, about the same. And when I've had these conversations with um, people who say scientists who talk about the number of women getting their PhDs, um, and then going into the workforce and getting tenured positions, it's about, the percentage is about the same, it's about 20%. So we know, we know that, I think, I mean, Ferris pointed out those, those statistics. We all know those and we've sort of, you know, harangued around about those for, for many years, but I wanted to just sort of use those to set the stage. Um, how does that translate into um, money and the marketplace and how much, how much um, a, a woman can, can garner for her, her artwork? Um, this is sort of a favorite person of mine to talk about in the marketplace because I think really she represents the most unfair place. And this is Elizabeth Murray, um, who died a year and a half ago uh, in her early 60s. And was really one, I think, of the most important artists to come out of the late 70s into the 80s, breaking down the whole strictures of minimalism and, um, and forging her own, um, her, her, her sort of own place in, in the world embracing figuration, I think, and opening up the whole world for people like um, Eric Fischel, for instance, to come into. Uh, this work is from 1984, um, and it came up at auction a year and a half ago. And the auction, her, at that time, her gallery prices were about uh, $250,000 to $300,000, extremely low if you compare those with, let's say, Chuck Close, um, maybe $2 million coming out of the, uh, coming out of the studio. And same, you know, you know, same age, same sort of colleagues, uh, as important in the in the whole sort of dialectic of art history, if you ask me. Um, this was up at auction for between seventy-five and, and ninety-five thousand um, dollars. 
you might have gathered from my my introduction that I've done I done I, I've done I done I've done a number of things. And I'm from Oklahoma, but um, that I've done a number of things in my in my life: um, curating, writing, uh, collecting art. Now with my husband, and um, and I have a, just opened a gallery at the prime time of um, last November. Um, <laughs> more about that later. But anyway. Um, so we bid on this because uh, we already had one Elizabeth Murray, and I was just like, "This is absolutely ridiculous. It can't go for. I know it won't go for that price." And then I got the phone call that we were the, the proud owner of this painting, um, which at the time I think had set her auction record at, with uh, hammer price and then twenty percent on top at ninety one thousand dollars. I think she now has sold for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, which I'm going to show you some auction prices. But let's just ca compare her with someone like. Uh, Dana Schutz, who is 30 years old, who also works large scale, I think is a terrific painter, and whose auction prices, primary market are low six figures, um, auction prices are two and three hundred thousand dollars. So um, you're looking at somebody who's 30 and somebody who, um, who died when they were 62, would be probably 64 years old today, the comparisons in, in the market. Um, I had another slide in here, and somehow it didn't, uh, it didn't transfer. Um, it was a, one of Pat Steer, and I'm going to show another one of her, hers, because she is another one I think is a very uh, good slash poor example of, of what's, what happens for w in women in the marketplace. Um, and I uh, have sold her work uh, to clients and to, when I was at the Orlando Museum, we bought a large-scale piece. And I, was, I, I took her to lunch one day to celebrate this, the sale of something. And, um, we were talking, and, and she was excited because she had in her purse a check for $100,000, which is a lot of money, and was very excited, and it shows that she's, Sally was very excited. So we walked around and looked at some exhibitions, and we went into the Bryce Martin show, which I think is a great comparison between the two, because they do large abstractions, they do variations on a very similar theme. And she said, how much are these works? And I'd already been in investigating, I said, they're a um, million dollars. And her work at the time was selling for $100,000. Again, it's that sort of 1 to 10 ratio, which I think is, if, if women show 20% of the time in galleries, I think their, their market value is 1 tenth. Um, I was giving this presentation to my husband. He said, you better be able to back that up. I, I, I don't know that I can necessarily back it up. I mean, if somebody can give me better statistics, um, I think that would be great. But, but, but my sense is that women, you know, well, I'm talking about historically important in museums, blue chip uh, women artists suffer about one tenth of their male colleagues um, in the same galleries of the same generation. Um, one of the things I did and, and still do is I work um, with, I worked with this one collector who um, has worked for about the last 10 years building a collection, which as she looked at me a couple years ago, she said, do you realize that most of the, of the people in my collection are women? I said, yeah. And it's not by design. It's not like let's go out and, and only collect feminist art or only collect um, women artists of the 80s or do particular things. What it was is she w had worked with me at the museum and she knew that she wanted to collect artists at the very highest level. Again, as I said, historically important blue chip desires. She had a limited budget. Now, when I say limited budget, I mean, a, let's say a million dollars as opposed to 10 million or 100 million dollars that we've seen thrown around the last eight years. Um, so you want to do that, what do you buy? Well, the answer is you buy women. Why do you buy women? Because they're not priced. Um, did I miss somebody before this? No, I guess not, okay. Um, they're not priced as high as their male counterparts. I'm gonna go, we only have five minutes, so I'm gonna move quickly through these just to show you some of the things that she was able to buy or that we bought together. Jane Hammond, Marilyn Minter, Judy Pfaff, this is from, um, it's a, a piece called Yongle from 1992. It's one of the very few um, domestic scale sculptures that Judy did. A more recent um, drawing by Judy Pfaff, uh, Pat Steer, Kiki Smith, Betty Woodman, uh, two Betty Woodmans. Actually, this was a challenge that we had for a house, which was there was a long hallway with, um, and this is in Florida, with a, a glass coming through and Betty had done these, had, had had her show at the Metropolitan and had done these canvas pieces with uh, pottery on them but the paint's done in, in slip which is, um, won't fade in the light. 
April Gornick, I'm sorry, this um, picture somehow didn't uh, translate. Lori Simmons. Um, if, uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are very familiar with the artwork, so you see that we're, we're sort of moving across um, medium, uh, sculpture, photography, painting. And then Kristen Baker, um, a, a younger artist. This is one of those uh, stories I have about being a sort of shameless art consultant. I was in the, um, down in Miami in the, in the Jeffrey Deitch booth and uh, being totally ignored and shoved aside. And um, my client wanted this painting. They said, well, somebody's kept, has it on hold. And I said, well, I'll wait here till they come back. And I waited there like 25 minutes and there were other people lining up behind me. And I was like, no, you're not getting it. I was like elbowing them out of the way. But my client ended up getting this, which um, again, you know, represents her able to buy something um, a, of a younger generation. It has a, a whole continuity to, uh, she has an Elizabeth Murray as well, to some of the older artists. Now this is not to say that she doesn't have people in her collection like Brian Hunt, uh, James Rosenquist, Chamberlain, Sarah, um, that I'm just not showing you. So it's a whole mix, which I actually really like the idea because it's a, it's a slice of uh, the art historical pie and not just of, of, of women. I throw Mary Heilman in because if we're going to talk about the market later, um, Mary had her first um, retrospective in New York. It just uh, closed uh, a couple months ago at the New Museum at the age of 68. And what's interesting and, and, and is that if you look at the work and some of the work of the younger artists that I'll show you in a minute, it's, it's this sort of riff or take on minimalism. And it's not as hard, I mean, it's not as easy in a way to understand as some of these, the, the figurative work of the younger artists are doing that have been embraced by the market. I just throw that out as maybe a discussion point for later, you know, the difference between abstraction and, and figuration in the market. Danny Schutz. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, some younger artists, who have, women artists in their 30s who have made a big splash in the marketplace. Danny Schutz, this is from a show up that is up right now at Zach Foyer. I happen to think it's her strongest show. It's a fantastic uh, show and a really fantastic piece. It's, it's figurative, but it also is, is sort of playing on what she's done in the past instead of the, the huge buildup of the paint on front. She stained this from the back. Um, I think you can see it at the, at the top. A lot of those, like the striped shirt, this is called a speech. So it's, I think it's um, you know, from revolutionary times, somebody's given a speech in the middle and people are gathered around and listening. And then the stripes are actually painted heavily in pesto on the, on the surface. Uh, it's a totally brilliant painting. Um, Marlene Dumas uh, holds the record, I think, um, we were talking about this earlier. Um, right now, as, as a, a female artist who had sold for the most money, um, her work, uh, $6,336,000. Um, what I'd like to point out about this uh, are a couple things. One is, it's the, the use of, it's, it's called The Visitor. It is um, uh, five prostitutes lined up uh, watching who's gonna come in the door and presumably choose one of them. Uh, she sort of flipped the tables and put us in the, in the, the role of the visitor too, like, like I'm not the visitor, but one of the girls that's gonna be um, looked at by the visitor. It's a figurative work, it deals with uh, taboo. Elizabeth Payton, um, I, I don't know if this is, sets her record, but it's a very high record for her, considering this piece is probably the size of a piece of paper. Um, sold for $741,000 um, a year ago. Uh, again, popular subject matter, um, representation. I happen to love all these artists, by the way. Uh, Cecily Brown, The Pajama Game, sold for $1.6 million. Uh, two years ago, you can see the figure in the middle, a lot of abstraction, uh, draws as her source uh, pornography. Again, we have um, taboo, subject, pornography, women, uh, probably n n nude women. And then Lisa Yuskavich, uh, whose show is up right now um, at David's Warner in, um, in Chelsea. And what was interesting about um, Marlene Dumas, again, I want to just throw this out maybe as a point of discussion, is that Roberta Smith in, in the New York Times, I think basically crucified the show. She said, you know, some people think, see it, you know, get really, it's hot or really cold, and I was just left lukewarm. And um, interesting, I have in the back of my mind, was she sort of, is she coming down on her because she has a strong place in the marketplace? You know, is it sort of this backhanded thing that, that people do to women, the women that do succeed, um, somehow when they have their chance at criticism, they, they try to cut them off at the knees. 
Um, this is a show that I have up um, currently at the at the, uh, my gallery, at Suzanne McClellan, who um, was the Dana Shoots of her time in her 20s, um, is an absolutely exceptional pa uh, painter, and really in a, in a very odd and interesting way sort of sat out the, uh, the art boom of the, of the last eight years. Had, that didn't mean she didn't show. She did projects that were, uh, and uh, drawing projects and installation projects that were very well uh, critically received. But um, what I find interesting, it, I kind of bookended those, the figurative works by Mary Harmon and Suzanne McClellan because if you see this, is there is a figure in it, a reclining figure uh, of, an, of a sort of an animal. Um, and it was done as a bl blind contour painting, meaning it was done, she looked at a book like this and, and at first drew it like this and then painted over it. It's, it's very rich, it's very much, it, conceptually it has a lot of ideas in it, um, one of which is the idea of the artist as performer. Um, but it is not a one-take thing, just like Mary Hyman's is and just like um, uh, Elizabeth Murray is. And I, I wonder, I kind of throw this out for discussion later, is that, is that again possibly a detriment in, in the market if the work is, is slow work in a way or something that, that sort of takes a lot of work on the, on the part of the viewer? Um, I just want to end with this quote by Marlene Dumas, because here you are, the woman artist who holds the, the record of $6 million. I, I don't know that that would be met today. But um, what, what she says about it is it doesn't change my attitude to the problems of the work. I still have the same problem, how to make a painting that will stand up to time. And I think uh, when we talk about cultural record, that's what we're talking about, is the way that, we, you know, where these women um, stand now, where they're thought of, and where they're eventually you know, my biases make their way into museums where they'll be preserved uh, forever, unless they're at the Rose Art Museum. Anyway, thank you. Satellite fair is also being held during Armory Arts Week, including Pulse on Pier 40, Scope on, uh, uh, in a tent on Lincoln Center, and the Volta Show at 7 West 34th Street across from the Empire State Building. 243 galleries participated from 22 countries. And despite the uncertainty and challenges of the art market, there were more than 56,000 visitors to the fair over five days, up from 52,000 last year. The fair was started by four young New York art dealers in 1994. Keep skipping. Can I go back? <laughs> I have to hold that. Um, the next one. Okay, that's it. And this is at, at the Gramercy Park Hotel. It was called the Gramercy International Contemporary Art Fair, and it was conceived in response to a period of recession, not unlike what we have today, and a severe downturn in the art market. There was no business going on in the galleries. So the founders, Pat Hearn, Colin DeLand, Matthew Marks, and Paul Morris, realized they had to do something, that in difficult times, the best solution was to band together, pool their resources. So that year, 30 dealers exhibited in the rooms of the Gramercy Hotel, and here's a few of them. <laughs> um, 5,000 people jammed the elevators and halls, there was artwork everywhere, on the beds, in the bathrooms, in the hallways. And for the next four years, the Gramercy International Art Fair was held in hotels in Los Angeles, at the Chateau Marmont, in Miami, as well as the New York location. It was such a great success and quickly outgrew its uh, initial form as a hotel fair. The fair was reintroduced in 1999 as the Armory Show, the International Fair of New Art, moving to the 69th Regiment Armory on Lexington in the 20s, which was the site of the legendary Armory Show of 1913 that introduced modern art to America, and it was there that Marcel Duchamp Marcel Duchamp's uh, new Descending the Staircase caused quite a stir in the art world. In, nine, in, seven, in 2007, the Armory Show became part of the Merchandise Mart Properties art, art Fair Group, 
which includes Volta, Volta Basel, Art Chicago, Next, and Art Toronto. This year, we expanded the fair and to include a new section called the Armory Show Modern. 67 international galleries and dealers specializing in modern and contemporary masters, really blue chip works, provided an expansion that gave us a historical perspective and you could move between the two piers, Pier 94 for contemporary art and Pier 92 for modern art and be able to see access and see works from the 20th and the 21st centuries. This is just a, this is a picture actually of uh, Pier 92 this year. During the press conference on opening day, Kate Levin, Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs of the City of New York, gave the opening remarks to 50 members of the international press. She emphasized the importance of the visual arts to the vibrancy of the city and recognized that the art fairs during Armory Arts Week contribute to the status and prestige of New York as an international arts capital and helps boost the city's economy. We worked closely with her office this year to expand the public programs during Army Arts Week. We partnered with museums and arts organizations, as well as galleries and artists for studio visits and tours. And each night during the Armory Fair, a different neighborhood art scene was highlighted, including Williamsburg, the Lower East Side, Harlem, and Long Island City. I've put just a few slides together just to give you sort of an overview of the fair and a selection of works by different um, artists, particularly women artists. This is a view of um, Rona Hoffman's uh, gallery's booth. And this is a picture of uh, a painting by Micheline Thomas, which was featured actually in the New York Times review of the show. Um, this is uh, a picture of the installation and performance piece called Apothecary by Christine Hill. Um, uh, this is a, this is just a picture. Of, oh, this is a Rachel White Reed um, piece that was offered by Lorcan and O'Neill from um, Rome. And this is just a picture of some, some of the visitors uh, walking through the fair. As you can see, there were a lot of women collectors and advisors and curators. Um, Every year we ask for submissions of large scale works and special installations from the participating galleries for the public areas of the fair. This 10 foot high work by Louise Nevelson was chosen for the entrance to Pier 92, the modern section. It was such a spectacular piece and we felt the embodiment of modernism. It was the first thing you, entered, you encountered upon entering the fair. Here's a work, um, a later work actually by Elizabeth Murray that was offered uh, by Locke's Gallery. And here is a, a wall installation by Jennifer Bartlett. Among some of the other women artists that were represented on the Modern Pier this year were Merritt Oppenheim, Alice Neal, Gay Go, Judy Pfaff, Kusama, Nell Blaine, Deanne Arbus, Yvonne Jaquette, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here's a picture of a Joan Mitchell that was offered. In our efforts to expand the educational component of the fair, we introduced a, do a docent program this year, and we invited art advisors, independent curators, and educators to give visitors and groups guided tours. We even published a children's guide to the fair and offered children's tours during the weekend hours. As a special project each year since 2002, the Armory Show has commissioned an artist to create the visual identity for the fair. And since 2006, in addition, they've been asked to produce special limited edition prints to benefit the Pat Hearn and Colin DeLand Cancer Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide medical expenses 
to those members of the visual arts community who are suffering from cancer. This year, Ewan Gibbs was the recipient of the commission. Here I've highlighted a few of the women who've, who have um, received the award. Um, the Armory Show introduced the annual artist commission with, as you can see on the upper left, Carol, Karen Kalimnik in 2002. She was followed by Barnaby Furness in 2003. Uh, Lisa Reuter is represented on the upper right hand corner and she was the um, artist commission in 2004. Jakob Nord Nordstrom was in 2005. We began publishing a series of editions with John Wesley in 2006, followed by Pippalotti Wrist, and she's on the left, bottom left-hand corner. Um, and then last year, Mary Heilman and John Waters shared the award and created a, each created a print. So I think this year we'll probably have another woman, <laughs> although it's not really something that we discuss, but it is you know, something that we do consider. We've already begun to work on the next edition of the fair and are planning several um, new initiatives, including an expansion of our public programming and education activities. Thank you. Good afternoon. When Kat approached me about this panel, uh, being from Christie's, I dabbled with the idea of either talking about women at auction or the art that we represent at auction uh, from South Asia. And I decided probably many of you who are already familiar with uh, South Asian art, but it doesn't hurt to show women artists from South Asia and where we began and where we are today in a very small period of time and it, it didn't happen accidentally. I think we all put our efforts together for where we are today. So I'm starting with actually a billboard, a film poster from Madras from the 1980s where it speaks of how women in India were represented. And even today, if you see a Bollywood poster, we are not very far from there. But this particular poster I chose because it has three parts. On extreme left, you have the seductress. The center speaks of the Indian beauty as voluptuous women um, also represented in um, sculptures of Indian temple. And on the right, it's the goddess. There is nothing in between. Either you're a seductress or you're a goddess. And of course, you are beautiful. <laughs> So I thought it would be interesting to start with that. However, going back in time, until um, in 1880s, uh, women were allowed to participate in exhibitions, but not until 1920 were they allowed to go to art schools. And one of the earliest professional women artists from India was Sunaini Devi, who was tutored at home also because she came from the Tagore family, which many of you are familiar with. She, Rabindranath Tagore was her uncle. So it was only in the affluent families or cultured families that women were allowed to take classes in art. Amrita Shergil, um, an artist uh, of Hungarian and Indian descent, uh, her mother was a uh, Hungarian and father an Indian scholar. Uh, grew up in Budapest and India and studied in Paris, but only lived till 28 years of age, and, uh, but made significant contribution to contemporary Indian art. She moved from Paris to live in India in the 1930s and began to paint Indian women um, and represent the cause of Indian women at that very young age when she was in her 20s. Um, she died in 1941. However, her contribution to contemporary Indian artists uh, who are women 
has been extremely significant. She's been an inspiration, and we cannot talk about feminism or women artists from this region without making a note of her. Most of the Indian artists, um, women artists, paint women, interestingly, and most of them actually paint themselves. Um, and I've picked some of the most well-known Indian artists, and I've just, I'm going to show a few examples of each of these women and their works. This is B. Prabha from 1960s, painting women and the daily chores that you see in India with her family, a caregiver. Arpita Singh, um, inspired by Amrita Shirgil, began painting in the 50s and continues to paint. And uh, those of you follow auction, uh, I'm sure are familiar. She has been selling very well. Um, she, again, paints herself as the woman and the body, and most this particular work is called, of course, Security Check, uh, and it's interesting how she shows the inside and the outside, and also her whole idea of how a woman is being at all times scrutinized in Indian culture as what is inside and outside, how she represents herself inside, in the house, and outside to the people. A lot of her works also speak of uh, different um, ideas of what a woman should be doing in an Indian culture. Nalini Malani, uh, contemporary of uh, Arpita Singh, um, sh has been shown extensively in various museums all over the world, including the new museum here in New York. Um, this particular work is called um, Remembering Toba Take Singh. It's a village in Pakistan now. Um, and this speaks of immigration. A lot of uh, these artists began uh, work pre-independence when Pakistan and India was one. And a lot of their works relate to uh, how people migrated. And this particular work speaks of the role of women also in migration. And all there were tin trunks laid out all over um, the installation where, with monitors inside the trunk speaking of the dilemmas and the pains and the anxieties of people moving back and forth from India to Pakistan and vice versa. But it is interesting, she's one of the earliest artists from India to have started using video installations and performance. So um, again, uh, has shown and opened up a path for a lot of younger artists, which I'll show a few of today. Again, this is Nalini Malani, also was shown at the Asia Society here and the Queen's Museum. She makes these large scale installations. Um, again, most of her subjects are either myths related to women and how it's mostly the fallen women, the witch or the vamp in every story. This is one more of Nalini Malani's work. Rekha Radwitya is again known as one of a very outspoken feminist artist from India. Um, this is one of her works called Sharing Secrets and the Cori Shell. She uses a lot of symbols in her works um, and again, the quarry shell represents the woman. Coming to the 1960s, artists, much younger artists, Anju Dodia is uh, uh, one of the leading uh, women artists of India today. And again, most of these artists, like I said, represent themselves in their paintings, including um, Anjudodia herself here, shown on the throne, and it's called the Throne of Frost. This was an installation she did at the Palace of Baroda, and I'll show you some of the pictures of, of this installation. It is situated in the palace, and the reason I brought this up is because 
not just the artists, but also galleries and dealers and collectors in India have made the effort to uh, promote women artists and have made space for them and encouraged them in every way possible to give uh, these large shows to these artists. Bharti Kher, um, a British artist now based in India of Indian extract, uh, left London to settle in India in 1990s. Um, again, works with women bodies, and um, this is called Arion. She made this in um, 2004, and it has a sister sculpture. Um, this is called Arion's Sister in 2006, which is like the Venus of the mall uh, where a shopper went berserk. Um, so it's interesting how the subjects vary. On the one hand, these women artists are talking about feminism. On, on the other hand, they're also making fun of this idea of the woman shopper who cannot control herself. Um, again, Bharti Kher, um, working off of, uh, this is called Mrs. Hera Moon, a model seated on a chair and having, uh, if we take a closer look at her, she has the same designs on the chair actually engraved into her skin uh, around her neck and a tarantula on her um, hand. Shilpa Gupta, um, I've put them sequentially even in terms of how uh, young these artists are. Shilpa Gupta is in her early 30s, um, works with video installations and uh, site-specific installations. Again, working with her own images. Um, this particular one is an interactive video installation where you get a sense that you're in control of these women because you as a viewer gets to come and play around with the mouse and make the women do different things. But what, what is said on the screen is what she thinks women are said at all times, shut up and eat, um, hey, hey. And so her entire video is all about how women are being told to do certain things. They are in these camouflaged uniforms. They're expected certain thing, to do certain things in India and follow the norm. And there is someone with a mouse trying to dictate what they should be doing. Um, a site-specific sculpture uh, installation of Shilpa Gupta. Um, this is called The Blame, where she has a whole room in red with bottles labeled as blame, and she went around all over Mumbai trains trying to hawk these little bottles and selling them and trying to tell people, I, I like to blame you. I like to blame you for what you're not responsible, your nationality, your religion, your color, and a very, very serious work uh, by this very young artist. Uh, Hema Upadhyay, again an artist based in Mumbai, works with her own body and her own photographs, and she situates herself uh, in every painting with these little photographs of herself cut out. Um, she looks at herself as an immigrant in Mumbai and talks about all the immigrants in the slums of uh, Bombay, which are actually producing most of our designer wear clothes. And, um, and basically the patterns are from, uh, in her painting are from those designer wear items. Chitra Ganesh is uh, more closer to home. She's uh, from the Indian diaspora based in Brooklyn who works off on the comic strips of um, Indian myths called Amar Chitra Katha, where all women are repre represented, uh, all have fair skin, and they're always garbed in these extremely sensuous clothing. Uh, and Chitra Ganesh takes a stance and says, uh, I will show what you want to show, but you don't show. So most of her women are uh, with exposed uh, breasts and uh, uh, her, our, uh, her works are pretty direct and sometimes uh, can be quite difficult to live with on the walls. Um, 
Anyway, these were a few things I put together just to give an idea of where uh, Indian art has moved from the 1920s to where we are today. And interestingly, in India or even uh, South Asia, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, most of the dealers and collectors are women. And uh, even more interesting, even at auction houses, most of the specialists are women. So we all um, are making every effort possible to uh, make sure we put our strengths and forces together to stand up for all these women artists who are very seriously being artists, mothers, and sisters, and everything it takes to be a full person. And um, also, I would, I would like to s still say that even though in the primary market where the galleries and dealers are concerned, um, though prices might be same, but at auction, which is the public price of an artwork, there is still a huge gap, and uh, we are all very aware of it. For example, Parthi Cares, uh, probably one of the highest selling uh, artists at auction from South Asia, um, selling for about 500,000, whereas her husband, Subodh Gupta, sells for over millions of dollars. And her works are definitely at par, if not even stronger and better. So it is, it is a concern, and uh, we, we are all putting our efforts together to see where we, how we can bridge the gap. And hopefully, you all will have some questions which I can answer. Okay, we're going to start with some questions for myself and Ferris, and then we definitely will open it up to the audience. So if you have questions, just hold on to those. When we get to that portion, if you could just proceed to one of the microphones on either side and um, so that everybody can hear your questions. So I'm just going to start with something really basic, which is um, I think Sue mentioned a little bit about and talked about some reasons. Um, why, um, how do we see, how do you see collecting practices changing now in time of economic downturn, especially in the different areas that you're working in? And, and how do you see this um, affecting uh, the prices for work by women artists? Anybody who'd like to start, really? Go ahead, Sue. So I'll start. Um, I just read this review by Jerry Saltz in New York Magazine where he said, um, the art market may be dying, but now maybe art can live again. And I think um, that that is something that all of us are looking forward to. Uh, I, I sort of frame it in the last eight years. I don't know why I say eight years, because I look at the rise of the art fairs and, and prosperity of global prosperity, where a lot of people invaded the art world and the art market uh, taking advantage of the, of the possibility of, you know, that art had become um, an asset class and was also um, openly spoken about that. I, I taught a class about that time, I think 2002, called, um, you know, Art as an Investment um, Taboo Topic or Smart Strategy. I mean, as, as little as eight or ten years ago, you couldn't, you, you, you shouldn't have really even talked, spoken about the art market, and then that's all sort of been blown away. So. Um, what I think will happen is, I, I showed the works by the women artists because I think we as everybody, especially women, should celebrate that women are uh, uh, broken through cer certain ceilings and are, are fetching a certain amount of money. Um, I think what will, will happen now, there will be a, a complete reevaluation, and it's very, it's very difficult, I think, in the gallery scene when you know there's, there's not that much um, money out there. Do you lower an artist's price? You know, what, what do you do? What is somebody, you know, like Cecily Brown, who sold at $1.7 million and sells in the high six figures? What do you do? You have to relook at those prices. Um, I think those people are in a tough spot. I think otherwise, um, I hope that what happens is it becomes a time when people really get back to the galleries and the museums. And even, I, I love the fact that you guys are expanding the. Um, the educational part of the art fairs, because it is a chance to see a lot of art from around the world, and that people will get back and start really looking at the art and slowing down in a way, and I think it is going to be a very difficult 
uh, transition back because we have forgotten how to talk about the art as the work on the wall. We've gotten so excited about this show sold out, this, show, this piece sold for that. We, we don't even know how to speak, I think, in terms of, of art, you know, critically speaking. And so I don't know if this is really answering your question, but what I, what I think will happen is that we'll get back, um, people will get back looking in the galleries, looking at the art and talking about it and, and getting back a community that was here prior to the rise of the, of the art market and, and I feel, I hope we'll come back. Anybody else like to comment? I'd actually like to speak to that because I think I'm on the opposite or the other side of the, uh, the gallery scene than Sue is in that I represent uh, young and emerging artists. So I have always talked about my art in terms of loving the art and it's never been a commodity. And if we have a sold out show, we have a sold out show because it's great work and people are excited about it. And our work is not expensive to begin with. So I do think uh, for a gallery who is showing emerging talents. It's a great time. I'm actually mm -hmm. doing better, and I hesitate to say that when people are having such a bad time, but I'm doing better than I ever have done because a lot of collectors that were perhaps spending $500,000 on a work no longer, even if they have the money, they no, no longer feel comfortable spending that because they're not certain what is going to happen in the market. However, they still are jonesing to, yeah, to buy yeah. something. No, so that. they do come and look at, at artists who are having uh, their first gallery show. We just had uh, a show of Kate Clark's work in October. It was her first gallery show ever, and it sold out opening night. Uh, having said that, the prices are much, much lower uh, than you would, you would have for an artist who has uh, a long uh, you know, and storied career. So those people who were maybe spending 500000 now they can spend 10000 or 20000 and get their art fix and have something really fabulous uh, and maybe buy it for the right reasons and not buy it as speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, what are the right reasons? Uh, I asked that question because we're assuming... It's a great, it's a great question. You know, we're, we're making the universal assumption that people buy art as an investment solely. And certainly the women with whom I uh, spoke and, and researched, their motivation was not about the bottom, uh, the bottom line. Um, and I told this story at our last um, program, and I'll say it again. One of the collectors, um, who was one of the top 100 collectors in 1992, had a beautiful Frida Kahlo, which she only paid $10,000 for, only $10,000, um, in the 70s, and she divested herself of it in the late 80s because by that point it was worth a million six. And every time she looked at it, all she could see was a dollar sign because anyone who came to visit her, and many curators did come to visit her, said, oh, how valuable it is. They didn't look at the art. They only saw it in terms of consumption. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, I do think that there's a lot of different reasons uh, that people buy art. And I think the right reasons are anything that is, that is fulfilling to them. It can be because uh, they have an emotional attachment. It's food for their soul. They feel happy or glad or content when they look at the work. It, can, it could be that they're buying it as, as a status symbol because they feel that it's a prestigious thing to have. Um, they, can't, they could be buying it because it makes other people in their life happy. Uh, or they, can, they could be buying it. I have a lot of clients that are very philanthropic and they buy things to donate them. So there's a, there is absolutely a lot of reasons. I don't, I'm not saying that there's an there's a incorrect reason. I do think, however, if people think of it as a purely business, um, one, of, one of my favorite stories uh, is I had a collector um, who came in, this is years ago, and they were looking at a very early AES plus F work. And uh, they said, well, what will, it be? what will it be worth next year? Will it double in price by next year? And I looked at them and I said, well, if it was going to double in price by next year, why would I sell it to you this year? So I think that people, <laughs> they have to look at it. If they, if they really love the work, they should buy it. And if they don't love the work, they should pass. Can I fall? I'm going to oh, go ahead. Just, just say Absolutely. something? Because um, you know, we just came out of a week of sort of um, a lot of art activity. and. This year at the fair, um, 
there definitely was not the frenzy that we had in the past um, years. Um, and it started, uh, you know, really in the fall, because I also attended Freeze and uh, FIAC, and then most recently the art show. So clearly there wasn't that frenzy of buying, but the fact that we had, you know, over 50,000 people at the fair, I think the dealer's expectations were already lowered but they were so pleasantly surprised by how um, people were genuinely interested in work and talking about it and considering it. It was clearly a much slower process to sell work, but that there was definitely interest. And a lot of collectors who may have been kind of shut out um, by the frenzy, I'll call it, because there were so many other people lined up for work, um, some of those people, and you would consider them serious collectors, are now, you know, f feeling taken care of. They feel like people are paying attention to them. It's, it's a completely different world. It's kind of reverted back to where it was even eight, ten, let's say eight years ago. And um, it's just, I think it's just a friendlier art world. Even people said to us at the fair, gee, everyone is so friendly and helpful. I don't know what it was. I had never done an art fair before, so I have no idea what it was like before. <laughs> but um, it was clearly was a different feeling. So, and I'm sure it feels it's the same way in the in the galleries. You know, there's just time to talk to people about the work instead of how much is it? My friend has it. I want one too. And what about the situation at the auction houses? Well, we came out of uh, a sale last week, and it is very clear. Um, our last sale of Asia Week was in September, uh, the night after Lehman Brothers fell. And, uh, but we, it didn't give us an idea. Uh, we couldn't gauge how far the market had gone because the sale did really well still. So we survived. Um, however, this last week's sale gave us a very good indication of all the speculators have moved away. It's all the um, collectors who were collecting in 2004, 2005, and were priced out are back. And these are the serious collectors who are actually looking at auctions to fill the holes in their collection. And this is the time they can actually collect. So my recommendation would be from what we saw last week is put out the best works you have that are at mid-level prices, not the highest level. And I think we have phenomenal women artists, and this is our chance, actually, to promote them and uh, bring them into really serious collections be because people are willing to look at them. People are willing to buy them. And they also want to not invest the entire amount of money in one work, but spread it out. So it's our best opportunity we have. You have Oh, go ahead. Sure. I just want to say one thing about um, why people collect. I, um, when I was a curator, I organized a number of shows from uh, collections. And um, a, this was in Orlando, and it was a couple years ago. And I had two, two collectors who had moved from um, more sort of blue chip older artists to younger emerging artists. And the reason that they did it is they, they love the idea of getting involved in the artist's lives and knowing them and helping them and knowing that by buying something this artist could live for three more months or call them up and and say you know I've got your uh, I've got your painting on my screensaver and so I think there's a couple of very you know excited younger collectors that really want to connect uh, with the creative process and, and be a part of it um, you, all of you actually brought up the difference in different types of collectors and the fact that the people are purchasing work, whether it's at Christie's or at the gallery, um, are different now. Um, obviously, the life of an artwork and the life of an artist, whether they end up in the cultural record, has some relationship to who's purchasing their work. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? Um, sorry. No, I was just going to say that I do, I do take into consideration, obviously, we want to, to uh, have the work in the best collection possible. That doesn't necessarily mean the largest name. It can mean the most generous person. Uh, I do have a lot of collectors that aren't maybe world famous collectors, but they're incredibly generous with loaning the work. They can buy it pay the artist for it and then not see it for two years and be perfectly happy to have it 
go around on a museum tour. And I do find that depending on the work, I will tap specific people that I know perhaps don't have a big name but are incredibly generous of heart and soul. Um, as an auction house, we don't have the liberty or <laughs> Uh, the choice of who we want to sell the works to, unfortunately. However, um, we, do, um, we do make sure that when there are works that, are, that have been selected for museums, uh, for different exhibitions, we alert every interested party that this work is being sold based, that, based on the fact that they would allow um, it to travel. So we do help in making it happen, but um, since it's a bidding situation, we cannot really choose our uh, collectors. I'd like to ask all of you as women professionals in the visual arts, I know Sue has said that she is a collector, um, if you yourselves collect art and how you come to choose the art that you collect, because that might also provide some um, information for the people in the audience? Uh, I think at last count we had about 300 artworks my husband and I have bought. Um, we're passionate collectors. If we love it, we buy it. It's, I, don't, I don't put my head in it at all. It all comes from my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned um, from those that I let get away <laughs> that if I, if I have a real visceral uh, reaction to it and I need to possess it, I'll find a way. So. I think um, it's sort of the, the same thing for me. It's just um, I for so long collected for a museum and not for myself. I would get things because somebody couldn't afford to uh, pay someone to write their catalog, so I would get a piece um, in exchange, and most of those by, were by women artists. But um, my husband and I have been collecting actively for about the last two or three years. And um, I think one of my favorite times as a consultant was when I was with this collector that I showed you. And um, we were at Pace, and it was during Art Basel in Europe, so nobody was around. And we went there, and they just happened to have gotten these Kiki Smiths in. And it was one of those things, and I just, I just, died and I could see that she was hesitating a little bit and I was like if you don't buy it I'm buying it and um, we ended up you know each sort of buying one and I think that's kind of a, um, a thing of as a consultant and a you know art dealer putting your money where your mouth is and really showing something that you're buying something that you that you believe in and, and you particularly collect art exclusively by women is that correct me yes no I don't okay I collect um, if I had to say I had any bias, it would be towards painting. Mm -hmm. I love painting, so I have, um, you know, Elizabeth Murray, uh, Suzanne McClellan, but I also have Tom McGrath and Christopher Benedict and, um, you know, Amy Silman, so, mm -hmm. so really sort of terrific painters. Uh, Deborah, are you a collector? Um, yes, I, I collect things. I've been collecting one piece a year for the last 30 years, ever since I started working in publishing, and it's, Usually it's either I become friendly with an artist and, and I just fall in love with their work or um, kind of like Claire, you know, you just have a visceral response to something and you say, oh, I have to have it. And then you put down $100 and you pay it off the rest of your life. <laughs> but um, I bought lots of different things. I happened, the oldest piece I have um, is an Isabel Bishop drawing. And it's so odd because it's the only piece like it in my whole collection. It's a draw I have drawings, but most of them are younger artists, and I just fell in love with it. So it's sort of like the, that's the highlight of my collection. And I had, I had a little Eva Hess, but I, I actually just gave that to my daughter. So if I looked at my collection, and I'm thinking about it now, it's probably more women artists than male artists. It's not, it's, but it was never, they're none, they were never chosen that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John? Um, I started collecting uh, at a very shoestring budget as a student, and the best outlet used to be at uh, school art fairs, where you could buy um, art from your faculty members who were all established, reasonably established artists. You could barter and exchange uh, with your fellow colleagues who were artists and art historians. 
And then I went on to become a curator, and uh, my husband, who's in the audience here, would always joke and say, you end up buying everything that you try to sell. <laughs> so, so my collection pretty much began uh, from a very emotional response of artists um, that I like, I show, and I end up buying. <laughs> so. I think I'm going to get one more question, then we'll open up to the audience. Um, the last panel, uh, Mimi Smith was on the panel, and she was speaking about um, the WAC exhibition. And actually, this would apply to many other larger exhibitions that were are exclusively women artists. Um, and said, you know, that she was kind of shocked walking through that some of these works that were considered so important, um, almost all of them, or a, the vast majority of them, were noted that they were still the collection of the artist. Um, she was suggesting also that, of course, if this was an exhibition about a movement, say minimalism, that might not be the case. So with that in mind and kind of with the future in mind, um, can you suggest strategies or new ways that galleries and auction houses and um, other outlets might um, approach their practices differently to, um, to work towards a level of parity? I, I don't know that you can consciously do something different. I have to say that I think it's coming. And the reason I say that is, I mean, if you think about politically where we are, two years ago, um, the, the pundits and everyone said we would never elect an African-American president and that we could never elect a woman president. And we have an African-American president and we had a, a woman who made a very viable run. And what, what I say is that a lot of the art that I showed um, are women in their in their thirties, but I think they've they've broken through, and I just I, I think as time goes on, I don't think it's going to make a, a difference as much. And I also think there is a difference in um, feeling of expectation of of women in their in their twenties and in their early thirties. They, you know, if you're sort of of my generation, I was happy to get a job in a museum. <laughs> it's like, yay, I get to work. And, um, but their generation, they, they expect it. And I think that, along with that expectation, will come change. And I think, um, actually, they say women always do better in a down market. So I think, I, I think the change will come faster than we think. You know, I just went to a, a breakfast the other morning, and Susan Rothenberg spoke. And it was really interesting to talk to her, because she was an artist that really was painting kind of in a, in, uh, with a group of other painters, um, but getting a lot of recognition. And um, she said at one point she was in a show, and she was the only woman in the show. And from that point on, she made it, she, she vowed that she would never be in a show again where she was the only woman artist. And, I think things like that, and I think people's just general awareness. Um, I mean, for example, you know, I showed those four uh, artists who, um, the four women who were chosen for this artist award for the Armory Show. We've already started thinking about who's the next one, and one of the considerations right away is, you know, maybe we should look, you know, maybe we should be looking at a woman, you know, a woman artist or young female artist. Um, I don't know if people would have thought that few years ago. When I worked in magazines and um, uh, we were always trying to figure out the next cover who, you know, it's kind of like insider trading, who's going to be on the next cover of the magazine. Um, I was on the business side, so I wasn't always privy to all the conversations, but there was all, you know, it always came up, oh, you know, we had a woman last month, maybe we, you know, we should wait. or this person's having a big show at the LA County or that's traveling. Um, I don't think we can wait. Let's just do two women in a row. So it was a consideration. Was it something that was quantifiable? I don't think so. It was always a question of quality and value and what the, you know, what the work was, what, what was the worth of the work. But, um, you know, if you go back and you quantify it, you know, you probably would see that Many more than 20% of the covers of the art magazines have been women artists in the last few years. So, I don't know. That's an interesting. Anybody else? I don't know. I would look through. Look at right. And when I, I went through, here's the catalog for the Armory Show, so I kind of I figured, uh oh, you're going to ask me some questions about it. But <laughs> I went through the list of artists, and this is not all of the artists that were actually represented at the show, but the list of artists that were listed by every single gallery. So there were, like I said, 243 galleries 
there's probably over 3,000 artists that are represented in the stables of those galleries, but it's approximately 20, 25% are women um, in here, so. Deepanta? Um, I, would, I would just like to add and say that I think every effort we make is important, how small, however small it is. And I'll give you an example. Um, since most of us specialists in our department are women, um, we were shown the Shil Shilpa Gupta's work, the blame uh, someone wanted to consign, and we were totally shot down because um, it's an installation piece, no one sells it at auction, especially in the South Asian market. And all the women got together and put their foot down and said, we will do everything to make it, you know, make it possible that this work is included because a lot of works get rejected even as they start getting offered uh, to the specialists. So I think it does make a difference. It does make a statement when you have a young woman artist being represented for works that she's chosen, um, a different medium. She's chosen to take a path which is uh, not very common. And I think we need to encourage that. And I think that's yeah. one way of doing it. I think we're going to go right ahead and open it up to the audience now. I think there's a question on the side. No. A little bit loud. Speak. I'm not sure the mic is on just yet. Wait a second, Linda. Okay, go ahead. I'm Linda Stein. This is, um, this is wonderful. I'd like to ask your response, speaking of parity and strategies. It seems that the women's liberation in the 70s scared the powers that be to a certain extent because they're not going to move without being a little bit scared. Um, and now we have an opening with the Obama administration. We really have a big opening, I think. And I'm wondering if we could go back to a thought I had and moderated some panel discussions on just around 2000, where any institution that receives government money, a museum or any nonprofit gallery has to have or move toward parity. They're getting taxpayer money. Shouldn't, couldn't we do something uh, to demand this? And we'd like to respond. That's a really interesting idea. Um, I mean, t my first thought is there's, then there's a lot of like red tape and bureaucracy and I, I, I wish that it could come from a, a different place of maybe even professionals demanding it. Like, can't we demand it of the curator of the Guggenheim that she shows more women artists? You know, we have curators or members of Art Table or whatever. I mean, that it could come from a different way. But so if there are any lawyers in the audience who would like to take part in this. I mean, I can think of a couple of sex and race discrimination well, lawyers I know, but we need a team. And, and I, if you want to be part of it, way. you can definitely talk to Linda. I'd love to be a part of it. Um, would anybody else like to respond to that question? I, I just, I'd like to make a comment about that. I guess coming from, and what Sue said earlier about uh, the next generation expecting it and coming, being, being sort of myself being in between maybe the next and, and the past. Um, and I actually am pretty good friends with Judy Chicago, who she and I go round and round because she's so militant and I, God bless her for it. But I always say the next generation does not need to be so militant. We need, to, we need to realize that they do expect it. Women who are in their 20s and 30s who are artists expect to be treated uh, in, the same, in the same way as, as uh, men artists do. And perhaps it's that expectation that will garner them the support and, uh, and the museum shows and, and, and so forth. And I guess that's why I always work uh, and work my gallery not, not in uh, a way that will um, 
offend or, or uh, ostracize any particular group, but just in a way that if it's good, it should be shown. And I do think that women art is as good, if not better, than a lot of men's art. We talked about that. And so I do think that if we continue on in the path of just um, working with that expectation that we will get equality, it will, it will come. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, I was part of the, the women artists in the 80s. That, that there were so many that very much felt they were very strong. They were moving after the, the 70s feminism. That net, did not seem to be the issue. What I found is there's probably a lost generation of women artists that are from this period that did not, they were either in the gallery scene shortly, they never even went into it. They went into their own life. They continued to create art over the last 20, 30 years. What happened, what, what I see is as these women are dying and things, some of their estates are getting lost. They're brilliant artists, almost like outsider artists never discovered. And what, what can be done for the collectors or people to discover these women? Because I, I, it's happening, people continue to create, they don't want to go into a gallery scene today at a certain age. Or some, they, they just continue to create out of necessity and they have incredible art that has not been seen at all. It's completely invisible. And I'd say there's hundreds and to thousands of these women artists. They've not given up, but they have not been discovered. How can that happen? I, I can respond to that a little bit since on Friday the Institute for Women in Art ran this conference just for this purpose to talk to present to artists um, planning ahead uh, even if they have not yet been recognized. You have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to keep good records. You have to plan for where those records, those archives will be deposited for future generations to see. Um, if you can, you should make sure that you uh, assign an executor who's particular as, as when you pass on, who's particularly interested in keeping your name out there and putting your work in places where it might be seen down the road. There are many different ways to handle this. This is after, I'm talking about after the fact, but it's your responsibility as an artist to take care of your own career and presenting yourself, even if you haven't done it to date, to make the plans for the future. I speak as someone who is an art historian who has spent the last 40 years mining archives, trying to find information about artists lost to history who were not, many of them, like many of the 19th century women authors, were top authors at the time in the 19th century, but they've disappeared from our are, are, are at the forefront of our knowledge at this point. And you have to go back and look and see, are there records about them? Were there reviews? Where can you find the information? Where are, where are their, their, uh, where's their artwork now located? Uh, and so forth. And really, you must be your own advocate. And I strongly suggest to many of the artists out there, I know your position. Believe me, every day I talk to artists who want to know what to do with their body of work and what to do with their papers if they're even organized. Um, you, you really have to, to be your own advocate and uh, be proactive. Would anybody else like to respond to this? And I think we'll take one more question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, Claire, I was um, curious to know and I'm assuming that because of your approach uh, in terms of the art that you are selling, whether or not you price male and female art uh, equally. Absolutely. So then my next question is, aside from saying brava, is how can you then influence other gallery owners to appreciate what they are holding and showing and selling as you do? Elizabeth, my work is selling. That should be the well, you, influence. You could that sell that to influence. other, other galleries. Absolutely. And, I, and, and again, as, as I uh, said in my talk, I do get, I get the word out there. I'm not shy about that. Um, we've, we've had three women shows this year. Two of the three have sold out. The other one, we have a very high hope, will we'll end up in a public um, Yeah, the question really had, has more to do with, with the value of the artwork. I'm sorry? The, va the monetary value, if you place the same monetary the value. The same exact, the Great. same exact. Thank you. Okay, 
Uh, Please. Yes, I'd like to address my comment to uh, something that you had said earlier. And with all due respect, uh, I, I am not really concerned about what will happen to my art after I die off. I'm really concerned about what's going to happen here and now. And uh, I look around the, uh, the room here, and uh, I don't know how many are artists. Um, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of you look in my age group, and I know it's very sexy and uh, marketable to talk about 30-something, but what about us? And I'd like all of you to address this generation. That's an excellent question. Would anybody like to respond? I'm not really sure what you're asking when you say, what about us, if that will... I, I mean, think the question is, we, there was definitely a lot of people talked about um, emerging women artists, but I don't think we talked... I think we're talking about the question of ageism. Is there, in addition to sexism, is there, which there really is, ageism, and how do as a woman artist who's maybe um, not an emerging artist, not somebody who's just coming out of an MFA program, um, go about um, representing themselves and showing their work and so forth? Well, I think... Um, question, kind of? Yeah? Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, the reason that I, I brought up Elizabeth Murray and Pat Steer is that I, is, that I, I see their, uh, their prices in the market. I mean, I, I see them in the group of, like, what about us, uh, too, because they don't, they don't have the, uh, the market presence that these younger artists do. Um, what I was trying to show is that there is, a, there is a progression towards equality, hopefully, and I think it's, it's moving slowly. Um, the what about us, I think it's a constant daily fight in, in a way. I mean, I have many, many female artist friends, um, and I think it's just, you, you know, you get up and do your, your art and you try to get it shown, and, and you know, I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, the, the thing is, it, is it, it is unfair out there, and it's people like us, I hope, are trying to, to work our hardest to, to make it um, equal. Let me also say that um, I recognize exactly what you're saying, and for that reason, AIR has, as far as I know, the only program like this in the, in the United States. Um, we have a program called the AIR Fellowship Program. Um, it involves a solo show, um, a membership, and involvement in the gallery for 18 months, 18 months of professional development, studio visits with art professionals, and a mentorship from, an, uh, from one of our gallery artists. This program has a very unique criteria. It's open to all women artists living in or around New York City who have not yet had a solo show at a commercial space or have not had one in 10 years. So actually this year um, we do have one artist in her 20s and I think she's the only of the six in the program that is in her 20s. Different years it's been people of different ages but I just would encourage, and I said this at another panel I did it recently, the other not-for-profit organizations out there who often can start to, um, can create programs that um, have a system and have a, a goal towards them that in a different way than I think a commercial gallery can necessarily um, to open up some of these emerging artist programs to um, underrepresented women artists as well. And I'd like to put in my two cents because I served on the fellowship panel this year for AIR Fellows. Um, and I found it particularly disturbing the number of artists who submitted materials for review which were impossible to read. Please, if you're going to go to the effort of applying for fellowships or working with gallerists, make an effort to, to make your images large enough to read, that they're focused, um, and they're presented in a professional manner. I could not believe the numbers of, of applicants who made, either made no effort, didn't know how to use technology, but I think, um, I think work with others to for those of you who may not be as comfortable to, to get your materials to the point where they're much more professional. And find the resources because we offer consultation as do most not-for-profits. Um, if you didn't learn this in school because they didn't give it when you were in school, right. we have those resources for you. So I think we have time for one more question. Am I correct? We have time for one more question? Yes. yes. Okay. Go Siona. Ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Siona Benjamin. I'm, I'm, I'm represented by Floman Half Gallery in Chelsea. Um, I have, uh, first thing I want to just say that it was a wonderful panel and um, it's so informative as have been the other panels. I also wanted to especially thank Claire, Oliver, because um, my, I, I, I persuaded my 13-year-old daughter to come on the sunny day, come and sit and hear the panel, and she said, oh, God, 
you know, and she's and what the way what you said couldn't have been better 